Hello, and welcome to The Mind of a Therapist, a podcast where I interview psychotherapists and helping professionals and what they're passionate about in order to provide you with messages of encouragement and hope. I'm your host, Andrew Earle. The Mind of a Therapist is sponsored by Psychological Counseling Services, healing hearts and transforming lives. Look into our intensive at pcsearl.com. In today's interview, I interviewed Dr. Derek Seabree. Dr. Seabree graduated with his doctorate degree from the Michigan School of Professional Psychology in 2016. He is a limited licensed psychologist with the state of Michigan who works primarily with college-aged young adults, adolescents, and adults. His approach to therapy involves the integration of client-centered, multicultural, and eco-therapeutic practices. Dr. Seabree works with a variety of issues including mood disorders, racial identity, anxiety, and adjustment issues. So without further ado, here's my interview with Dr. Seabree. Uh, we're going to talk about um, social justice and eco-psychology in the therapy room. And so I'm wondering if you can just um, start by giving our listeners a, a bit of background on uh, eco psychology and social justice. Sure, sure. Um, you know, eco psychology is one of those things that I really think um, has been around for much longer than what we we talk about. Uh, um, really, I think in the sense of uh, often when we're talking like in indigenous knowledge systems, things like that. You know, really. There's already this idea of, you know, ecology as a part of um, you know, humanity as it stands. Um, but I think eco-psychology itself really kind of came into the Western kind of like mindset probably within like the 90s. So like mm-hmm. mid-90s, um, Theodore Rosick uh, was the really kind of like the original um person who really started to talk about this idea of, you know, what does it mean that um, humanity's relationship to the environment has, has had so much happen within it? Um, so, you know, just talking like lots of environmental disasters. Um, so what does that mean for the impact on us, right? So, like, thinking of it as a reflective relationship. Hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that. I I'm I'm grounded in uh, narrative therapy, and one one practice of narrative is, uh, you know, how do you with it with within the context of therapy is how how does the problem um, affect your life, and then how do you uh, contribute uh, to the problem? And I like that looking at both sides of a relationship to a problem, or in this case, to the environment that that makes a lot of sense in the ecosystems we inhabit. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's definitely, and then I think that's where the social justice piece often comes in for me is, you know, our, in a sense, if we're talking the importance of our relationship to nature and, you know, the really thinking about the impact we have on nature, then it's this idea of, well, part of that also means thinking about the impact that, we have on each other mm. when we're using nature as that vehicle. Sure, absolutely. And and then, what? How, how does this? Uh, what, what sort of implications um, does this? I mean, it to me it seems like v- very clear the the implications of like what sort of um, impacts do we have on uh, relationships with with others in terms of in the context of, of therapy. I'm wondering with uh, with eco psychology, people's uh, relationships to the the natural world, what sort of um, implications uh, does does that um, understanding have in the context of therapy? Sure, that's a great question. Um, yeah, you know, I really think of you know within the last, I'd say, really ten years, there's been a lot more. I think research on really kind of the what what is happening on the biological level um, 
when people are having these experiences with nature. Um, so I think of the concept of what we call forest bathing. Um, and so it really started uh, out of Japan and the term was um, Shinrin Yoku. Um, and so it loosely, it loosely translates to forest bathing, um, which is really this concept of, okay, I'm going to go out in the woods and I'm going to go on a hike, you know, maybe for like half an hour and I'm just going to maybe do a mindful hike. Um, you know, so what we found is the, you know, a lot of the research that came out from that is it has a really big impact on um, our immune system. So we found out that trees themselves actually give off uh, pheromones, which are, in mm-hmm. a sense, like antiseptic pheromones. You know, it's for the really for the purpose of keeping the tree clean, like the tree needs you know, to survive and not get sick. So, but what we found is there's kind of a relationship that has for us. And when we're out doing that forest bathing, that hiking, we actually breathe in those the those same pheromones. And that's really boosts our immune system too. Mm-hmm. So just kind of seeing this idea of again, like that connection to nature is innate. Like, you know, even I've never known that. We've never thought about that. But here we are finding it. Yeah, that's that's so fascinating. Um, I I just what came to mind for me is. Um, my my wife is uh huge into spending time in the outdoors and connecting with the natural world and uh she is always joked and you know about like hugging trees and connecting with trees and i guess that there's actually some literature that suggests that ha- that being around uh trees uh, connecting with trees ha- being being in this place of mindfulness in, on a hike actually has uh, benefits to the immune system, huh? Right. It's like, you know, we, we maybe felt it in some sense, on some level, you know, just like, oh, I feel, you know, having a hike, I feel maybe less stressed. Um, you know, like, we know it drops things like blood pressure, um, you know, it increases our natural, or natural, killer cells so you know really the immune cells responsible for fighting things like cancer um so really we see this you know this almost this quality of nature um really providing for humanity in ways that you know humanity has, has never had to worry about and so really kind of that idea of what we almost call the biophilia hypothesis so um E.O. Wilson coined the term, and really it's the idea that, you know, we are biologically structured to be in relationship with nature. Like nature, is, we share a symbiotic relationship with nature in that way. And I think the idea of the fourth season just really highlights that. Hmm. Absolutely. And then um, shifting to that piece of uh, social justice in our uh, relationships with others. Um, I'm wondering if you would uh, speak um, just a a bit more on, um, I know that, you know, this, this current political climate that we're in, there's so much divisiveness um, and uh, opposition. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm curious if you'd speak to how, how folks might navigate um, relationships with people who are different for them from them, whether that's a political difference, whether that's um, a difference in, in in background, ethnic background, racial background. I'm wondering if you could give the listeners some ideas on how to navigate relationships with with people who are are different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's a great. Great piece, yeah, and that, you know, really in a sense, like, there's, you know, really this hyper-polarization going on, there's, um, you know, I think often in that sense, kind of this idea of depolarization, right, this really trying to, how do we bring a sense of balance um, to really most discourse, I think, these days, which is 
and kind of taken out of a lot of a lot of that rhythm. Um, you know, so really think of you know from my um, orientation, you know, as being humanistic existential um, as well, along with that social justice piece is, you know, for me, it's how do we, in the sense of, for some of this, and you can't always do this, and I think that's the struggle is, you know, how do we bring some semblance of um, compassion and empathy when having discussions, which I think for people is really difficult when you're when these discussions get very emotional um, because they're often very personal. So, yeah, you know, it's a matter of how do we, how do we bridge that gap? I think of uh, a, one of, one of our uh, fellow humanistic scholars and colleagues, uh, you know, Dr. Kirk Schneider has really worked um, towards this idea of what he, what he called like depolarization of, of, really these this political context, right? And that's you know, just uh, allowing people to be able to talk in a way where to be able to voice, I think, really the struggles that people are having, but without having necessarily the, the vitriol or the really the emotional kind of breakdown of the conversation, right? Mm. Yeah, I'm really I'm curious that uh, I'm so drawn to that idea of of depolarization that you're talking about. And I'm curious, I know, for me, I'm um, a therapist in training right now, uh, studying marriage and family therapy. And I'm uh, starting my I've started my internship phase of my training. And so I've been working with uh, a lot of individuals now, and I'm starting to um, work with some couples. And, um, yeah, that, that piece of, um, depolarization and stepping out of that emotional reactivity and creating a space where people have opportunities for, uh, that to d- develop empathy and compassion. Um, you know, that's something that I'm really interested right now in, in learning how to create space for. And so I'm wondering if you have any ideas of, of how one might, uh, create space for the development of that um, compassion and empathy and or how one uh, yeah engage in that depolarization yeah yeah um, you know I often think of it in the sense of what you know a lot of the referencing these days in some sense of being what we call brave spaces you know so mm. in the sense of inviting people and to a space where it's the, the goal is to be vulnerable and really not necessarily the idea of like having those feelings um, directly, I wouldn't say placated, I think that maybe more addressed and, and trying to quell those feelings. Like, you know, in the sense of the brave space being there may be negative feelings, but asking everyone to be able to sit with those mm. um, and be willing to sit with those, you know, as you work towards the same, you know, whatever the larger goal is. Sure. Yeah. I, I love that concept. Bra- brave space of vulnerability, uh, sitting with those, those challenging feelings. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think often the, you know, you think you see it really usually in the sense you know, when we talk social justice, it's, you know, how do people have conversations about race without, you know, getting into really kind of these um, conflicts, you know, these arguments mm. in a sense. And I think part of that often is, is really the intent. So, you know, when we're thinking, I think, politically, and the idea is like everyone's kind of, confronting each other, right? Like you've got family members confronting other family members over the dinner table. And but the the goal in that confrontation I don't think is necessarily about education. The goal of that confrontation is to challenge and mm. to in some cases to shame. And so you know in that sense you can't have a dialogue there. And so I think also it is 
opening more of those spaces, like you say. Hmm. Well, that 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 makes a lot of sense. Is uh, what is um, what is your intent? Uh, and um, I'm actually I just reminded I was listening to this podcast today. is a permaculture podcast, and this guy was talking about agriculture and how he ended in a place where he realized that more organic or regenerative styles of agriculture were uh, better for yields, better for the planet, better for the health of the, the plants and food. And he's realized that at first he started off with just criticizing what was happening, you know, really criticizing heavy herbicide and pesticide use. Um, and he found that a lot of the conventional farmers that he was talking to with that approach would just kind of distance themselves for him. And so um, his big thing was what you were talking about earlier is as he um, cultivated empathy, uh, had that intent and posture of empathy, as he built those relationships with farmers who were um, doing more conventional approaches, then he could work within their frame um, to, uh, you know, w- come alongside them and uh, support them in the goals that they had, which was having healthier plants, you know. And so he kind of stepped outside of um, the some of the oppositional discourses in that sphere and used that, had that intent of, empathy and compassion and yeah that that seems so central uh, to these conversations of social justice or um what whatever the political uh, discussions etc mm-hmm. yeah, i think it's a struggle is it's just, well i'm reminding you of this concept of um, what we call and this is othering mm. so this idea is when you know we we always designate someone as the other. And so, you know, really these days, politically, I think you see that in the sense that people live two different, maybe even more than that, realities. Like mm. people don't see the same world, right? And so that is, and I think that creates this, creates a level of divisiveness in the sense that it's not, it's, it's almost like it's to the point where yeah, this is different because it is different. Like, you know, the idea of fact being able to be changed to kind of fit the situation. You know, and so I think that's a that's a part that makes it difficult to kind of get past a lot of that, um, a lot of those walls that are kind of built up mentally, I think. Mm, absolutely. Uh, and in uh, I was looking through um, your your bio online, and it said that there is you have an interest in uh, intergenerational trauma, and I was wondering if you'd speak a little on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's to me. I really, and I think that's often one of the links that really pops up for um, for me for social justice and eco psychology in the sense that. Um, you know, nature is also often been a, a vehicle, I think, for violence against many oppressed groups. Um, you know, you're thinking, yeah, you know, the idea of people going out in the woods and, you know, people having all kinds of things happening from, you know, lynching to, you know, just really, you know, gross displays of, of terror in that sense. And, and so, now, in a sense, intergenerational trauma just, you know, that doesn't go away within one generation. Like, we, we definitely know now, um, you know, scientists have, have found various links of really just the passing down of, you know, genetic memory. So, you know, we've yeah. seen it within mice and small form, but we know that it exists within people and in big form. Like, even in a sense, like, a, a system, family systems wise, just, you know, the family system is a generational, you know, system. So it, and part of that is if there is any kind of trauma generationally, that's going to get carried on as an know, like it gets acted out across generations, you know, mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. some generations decide to do something different. Hmm. Yeah. And I'm, I'm curious about that piece of, uh, 
of how how people, how families, couples, um, might might shift and 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 heal from the those intergenerational traumas that are passed down in family systems or uh, societal systems. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that's often that um, a large part of that really social justice, environmental justice pieces is like, you know, how you dismantle on one level, on the macro level, I guess, the system that perpetuated. Um, you know, so really even, I think in, often for me, it's helping people be aware that these are systems that are affecting them. Um, mm. You know, in a sense, so even if we're talking environmentally, uh, Helping people be aware of, you know, what, what the, what are the impacts of your environment? Like I think people often think of themselves as, you know, being able to be an island. Like we can, hmm. you know, we, we feel fine, you know, we look fine. So then that means we're fine and the world might be fine, right? So this kind of generalizes to our to our whole worldview. Um, but I think being able to raise that consciousness in the sense of helping people realize, like there are aspects of our lives that we really have to tune into to be able to um, to work with that. You know, whether it's, hey, what's going on in your environment? You know, what's, what's, your, what's your air quality? What's your water quality? You know, like, hmm. you know, what's your, what are those pieces? Um, you know, even, and then I think intergenerationally when it comes to that, it's on a lot of levels, like trying to help people find ways to empower themselves, you know, empower families. Um, you know, I think environment, like eco psychology is a, offers a beautiful way to do that because I think one of the ways that people have often been harmed and, and through trauma is being disconnected from the land, the environment, you know, whether it's indigenous or, you know, other um, people of color at that, that point, like there is often this component of, disconnection from the environment around you, you know, so mm-hmm. how do we foster that? Like maybe it's community gardens. If you're looking at how do we build communities like, and how do we actually, you know, help grow these communities and heal these communities that have been through trauma too, you know, or with a family, an individual, like, you know, on various levels. Um, it also reminds me of, you know, something that, um, like I remember, Probably in my undergrad, I, I used to work in downtown, well, not downtown, but just Detroit a lot in terms of like working in a lot of the urban agriculture um, and working out on a lot of the urban farms and helping helping folks. And I remember my grandmother was like, you know, you're doing a lot of this volunteer work. And yeah, at the time I was in college, I didn't really have a job. And so she was just kind of like, you know, we you know, your ancestors did that so that you didn't have to. Mm-hmm. And so just this, almost like this. And that still sticks to me today, like, almost like a sense of, like, you know, you, people toiled, you know, people were sharecroppers, slaves, things like that, and, you know, were in these really disempowered positions and had to do this work, so why would you go back and choose to do this? And and what was uh what was your your response to her? You know, I ended up just kind of saying like, you know, this is, you know, I think it's important. I was like, you know, I want to, and for me, it was again the idea of like I want to help people. Like, hmm. you know, I was like, I did. I guess it was like I understood what she meant, hmm. and at the same time, it was like I think that's to me, it was like that's the point. Like you kind of have to reclaim that. Mm. Yeah. So the reclamation and that empowerment piece that you're talking about. Yeah, I'm re- really drawn to what you're just sharing about um, having uh, like a, a awareness of how um, systems are affecting uh, us, and then uh, moving towards uh, I- empowerment and. Uh, uh, reconnection to to land and um, and and other people, right? Exactly. Well, 
Well, I'm curious, Dr. Sabri, if there's anything um, else that is uh, coming to mind, anything else that you're wanting to uh, share with our listeners. Yeah, I mean, I think of, you know, I think really a lot of this comes up for me, especially now in this time of COVID. Um, you know, it's like, I think now people are starting to really wake up to the idea of these, how these forces and these systems really, you know, can lead our lives in directions that, you know, we're not even aware of, you know, in that sense. Mm. And I think that, that's really terrifying. I think for people, you know, for BIPOC, um, people that's often something that they're very aware of, but I don't think everyone's always aware of how these systems can really influence that. Um, you know, so really thinking on that eco psychology front now is, for me, is even, even more important, you know, especially as far as the social justice side goes. Um, Mm. Absolutely. And yeah, I'm so um I'm I'm thinking so much with that uh eco psychology piece and um the intergenerational trauma that, that you were talking about of uh nature in the past uh being a, a vehicle for um oppression and that's that wasn't really something that uh was present in my mind so thanks for uh bringing bringing that to my awareness yeah i think that's the that's the interesting part of this and it really you know because we think it's like the idea of the great outdoors right like mm. the idea of like nature being and, and you know welcoming like, ah, I, don't, I don't think everybody has that idea yeah yeah uh. Well, uh, Dr. Sabri, we're, we're coming to the end of our time in the interview here. Uh, the question I, I like to ask uh, at the end of the podcast is, um, what's a message of, of hope you'd like to leave the listeners with? Hmm. Well, I would say is that, you know, the message of hope that I have for folks is, you know, as you really continue to, you know, just build your own awareness and consciousness around these pieces, you know, I hope that helps folks to find ways to take action and the more folks that you know are able to be aware and take action you know the more impact it has Mm -hmm. absolutely what a what a great message of the awareness and then and 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 action and uh appreciate that um and then if uh, for uh, those who might want to get in touch with you, um, where's a good place to uh, direct them? Sure, they can. Um, I can give you my email address um, for my academic email. So folks can always feel free to shoot me an email. Um, and then we can do it that way. Perfect. And, and what would that uh, e- email address be? It is um, D C Bree, so like my last name, like D S is in Sam, E is in Echo, B is in Boy, R is in Ralph, E is in Echo, and E is in Echo. And then at M S P dot E D U. Okay. Perfect. Well, thanks so much for uh, being on the podcast today. Thanks so much for having me, Andrew. Please press the subscribe button, as well as rating and reviewing our podcast. This helps others connect with what you've been hearing. If you have any questions, please contact us at themindofatherapist at gmail.com. These questions will be kept anonymous. I want to thank Eric Price for the wonderful music you hear in this podcast. Additionally, this podcast was created to provide accurate and authoritative information on the subject matter. Although we are interviewing licensed therapists, they are not your therapists. This podcast is not intended to serve as direct medical advice and should not be used as a substitute for direct professional help. It is given with the understanding that neither the host, publisher, guests, 
or PCS are rendering legal, clinical, or other professional information. If you need a professional, we encourage you to find one. Visit Psychology Today to connect with a licensed clinician near you.